Good morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm Douglas Simpoga in Washington. Today is Wednesday, October 4th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. The World Health Organization approves the second malaria vaccine. This mission is a fundamental intervention to provide the necessary conditions for Haiti to consolidate its development and governance. Kenyan President William Ruto welcomes a new UN Security Council resolution authorizing a foreign security mission to intervene in Haiti. Joseph Betty Asomo is Cameroon's defense minister. Son Excellence Monsieur Paul Biya, President de la République du Cameroon. Asomo says Chadem President Mohamed Idris Deby Itno and his Cameroonian counterpart Paul Biya have ordered militaries of the two states to jointly monitor and protect their borders from violence perpetrated by the Islamist radicals and armed gangs. And defense ministers and security experts from Cameroon and Chad meet in the Cameroon capital Yaoundé to map out ways of jointly combating growing security threats along their border. Those with and more coming up on Daybreak Africa. For the first time in U.S. history, lawmakers voted Tuesday to remove the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives from power. Republican Kevin McCarthy was removed from his position as Speaker in a 2016-2010 vote triggered triggered by a rare challenge from his own party. Republican Representative Matt Gaze filed a motion late Monday to force a vote on removing McCarthy, expressing frustration with his leadership after McCarthy failed to pass a government funding bill last week with conservative spending priorities. The slim Republican majority in the House meant that Gaze needed only a handful of Republicans to vote along with Democrats to oust McCarthy. The majority of Republicans voted to keep McCarthy in leadership. In West Africa, defense ministers and security experts from Cameroon and Chad are meeting in the Cameroonian capital Yaoundé to map out ways of jointly combating growing security threats along their border. Moki Edwin Kinzika reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. Defense ministers say a day hardly goes by without cases of either Boko Haram terrorist attacks or cross-border crimes, including armed gangs attacking civilians and wildlife, reported on both sides of the border between Cameroon and Chad. The two Central African states say they share a more than 1,100-kilometer porous land border that facilitates the escape of armed gangs and Boko Haram terrorists to either Cameroon or Chad when chased by government troops. Joseph Betty Asomo is Cameroon's defense minister. Son Excellence Monsieur Paul Biya, President de la République du Cameroon. Asomo says Chadian President Mohamed Idris Deby Itno and his Cameroonian counterpart Paul Biya have ordered militaries of the two states to jointly monitor and protect their borders from violence perpetrated by the Islamist radicals and armed gangs. He says keeping Cameroon and Chad safe from rebels, terrorists and armed gangs is synonymous with contributing to stability in sub-Saharan Africa in particular and Africa in general. Asumo also said tens of thousands of Cameroonian citizens who fled bloody battles between fishers and herders in northern Cameroon last year are still in Chad. Chad's government says the displaced persons are refusing to return to their communities in Cameroon because of frequent conflicts between herders and fishers. Defense ministers from the two countries say the slaughter of elephants in Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, and the Central African Republic by criminal groups such as the Lord's Resistance Army, the Sudanese Janjaweed Militia, and Cameroon and Chadian poaching gangs has been reduced. But the proliferation of weapons left behind by rebels continues to be a threat to wildlife and civilians in the two countries, the ministers say. The ministers say elephants are slaughtered for their ivory, which is in high demand on Asian black markets. Daoud Yaya Brahim is Chad's defense minister. Nos populations aux frontières sont quotidiennement 
He says Chad and Cameroon have to immediately stop high waves of kidnappings for ransom along their border and cattle theft, the slaughter of elephants and cross-border criminality that continues to be a threat to peace and makes living conditions very difficult for civilians who are living on less than a dollar a day. He says socioeconomic development along the Cameroon Chad border has been highly compromised by rampant insecurity. Chad and Cameroon say civilians are currently held hostage by armed gangs, but did not say how many of the civilians are being deprived of their freedom. Joseph Vensang Tuda Ebude is a lecturer in international security and defense at the University of Yaoundé Sua. He also serves as director of the Yaoundé headquartered Center for Research in Political and Strategic Studies. Le Cameroon et le Tchad collaborent pour l'exploitation. Tuda says he doesn't understand why it has taken up to 10 years for Cameroon and Chad to organize such a high profile security meeting when Chad needs Cameroon to secure a multi billion dollar 1,000 kilometer pipeline that transports oil from the Doba oil field in southern Chad to the deep sea port in Kribi, Cameroon for exports. Ntuda says the Cameroonian government also needs Chad to stop armed gangs, Boko Haram terrorists, militias, and rock units of national armies from Chad, Sudan, and the Central African Republic from entering Cameroon. The defense ministers say they will enact the presidential plans to counter these various regional threats. They did not say when they will begin military operations. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yaoundé, Cameroon. Kenyan President William Ruto has welcomed the new resolution approved Monday by the UN Security Council authorizing a foreign security mission to intervene in Haiti. Ruto says he hopes the so-called multinational security support mission his country is leading will provide a different footprint in the history of international interventions in Haiti. VOA Nairobi Bureau Chief Mariama Diallo has this story. In a taped speech shared with the media on Tuesday, Kenyan President William Ruto said he hopes the so-called multinational security support mission, which his country is leading, will make a difference in the lives of Haitians. I welcome the resolution as an overdue and critical instrument to define the multinational mission. This mission is a fundamental intervention to provide the necessary conditions for Haiti to consolidate its development and governance. Ruto said it is essential that resources, as well as the operational scope available to the UN team, be appropriately reinforced. This comes after the UN Security Council voted late Monday to authorize a foreign security mission to intervene in Haiti a year after the Caribbean nation requested help to quell violent gangs. Kenya offered to lead the operation in Haiti two months ago, saying it's willing to deploy 1,000 of its police forces. On a recent visit to Kenya, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin lauded the plan. And we intend to work with the United States Congress to provide up to $100 million in support. And we, work, we urge others in the international community to follow Kenya's great example. Austin was in Nairobi with his Kenyan counterpart, Adan Dwale. Kenya has a very long uh, history of global peacekeeping. We were in Kosovo, we were in Namibia, we were everywhere. We are now in Somalia, we are in DRC. We have our officers in the Tigray monitoring and evaluation uh, mechanism. But others like Eugene Wamawa, a former Kenyan defense secretary and the leader of the Democratic Action Party of Kenya, told VOA he has some concerns. Uh, would expect uh, the, the process to be transparent. First of all, starting with our National Assembly, our parliament should approve this. We expect that this matter should also be discussed uh, at the EU before being uh, elevated to the UN. You know, the principle of subsidiarity should apply. But here, we first heard of it during UNGA in New York. Then uh, we had the Americans praising us for offering our troops. We're not even aware we are sending our police officers in harm's way. We have not discussed it. We have not agreed as a country. UN peacekeepers were deployed to Haiti in 2004 after a rebellion led to the ouster and exile of then-president Jean-Bertrand Aristide. 
peacekeeping troops left in 2017 and were replaced by UN police, who left in 2019. Amnesty International Kenya on Tuesday urged the UN member states, other human rights organizations and citizens to thoroughly examine the mission's human rights and humanitarian implications before the deployment. Meanwhile, Kenyans who spoke to VOA are divided on their police force, possibly going to Haiti. We have a lot of problems, not only in the country, but also in Africa. We have problems in Sudan, we have problems in Somalia, we have security problems in um, several parts of Africa. If we wanted to solve any problem, security problem, we could have started with home or at least regionally. It will help to cause them to have peace in that country, number two, to show that this country is a peaceful country, we can exercise peace in other countries. That is a very powerful thing this country has done. Okay, it, I, I support it with 100%. The mission has been initially approved for one year with a review after nine months. It was not immediately clear when Kenya will deploy its police contingent to Haiti, but senior government officials have suggested it could come as soon as early next year. Maria Majalo, VOA News, Nairobi. The World Health Organization approved a second malaria vaccine Monday. It's hoped the new drug will quickly be rolled out in countries across Africa in the coming months. Henry Ridgewell reports from London. A new malaria vaccine known as R21 was developed by Britain's Oxford University along with the Serum Institute of India. It is already in use in Ghana and Burkina Faso. The World Health Organization approved the drug Monday, paving the way for its wider rollout. Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus is Director General of the World Health Organization. Yes, with seasonal transmission, it reduced symptomatic cases of malaria by 75% in the 12 months following a three-dose series of the vaccine. A fourth dose given a year after the third was shown to maintain protection. The WHO approved the first ever malaria vaccine in 2021, known as RTSS. As a malaria researcher, I used to dream of the day when we would have a safe and effective vaccine against malaria. Now we have two. The WHO says there is little difference in effectiveness between the two vaccines, but the new R21 vaccine is cheaper to make at around two to four dollars a dose, with each patient needing four doses, about half the price of RTSS. The new vaccine can also be made in much greater volumes. The Serum Institute of India is already in line to make 100 million doses a year, with plans to double that output. Experts warn that it won't beat malaria on its own, and that other preventative measures are needed, including mosquito nets. Azra Ghani is an epidemiologist and professor at Imperial College London. So this additional efficacy of the vaccine is in the presence of this really important intervention. The second is something known as uh, chemo prevention, that's providing uh, drugs to children in high risk areas where malaria is particularly seasonal. There were an estimated 247 million cases of malaria in 2021, a small increase on the previous year, and 619,000 deaths, mostly children, in sub Saharan Africa. Ghani expects the new vaccine to have a major impact. We do hope that this. By um, introducing this new vaccine, we can really make a dent in this and get us back on track to the goals which uh, were set by the WHO to reduce malaria by 90% by 2030. The WHO also approved a new vaccine Monday against dengue fever, another mosquito-borne disease common in tropical Latin American and Asian countries. The drug, made by the Japanese firm Takeda, was about 84% effective in preventing people from being hospitalised in clinical trials. Henry Ridgewell, VOA News, London. Nigerian Workers' Union late Monday has suspended an indefinite strike action bill to commence Tuesday after new negotiations with government officials in the capital. The workers' unions for months have been protesting the removal in May of expensive fuel subsidy payments by President Bola Tinubu. 
Nigerian authorities during the meeting announced a temporary wage increase for civil servants, suspension of value-added tax on diesel and monthly stipend for 15 million vulnerable households. Timothy Biezo reports from Abuja. The suspension of the indefinite nationwide strike followed several hours of meetings among the leaders of the Nigerian Labour Congress, NLC, the Trade Union Congress, TUC, and the government. The unions issued the strike notice last month to protest living challenges facing millions of people as a result of government reform policies that included the removal of fuel subsidies. But the government pledged a temporary wage increase of 35,000 naira or $45 for federal workers until a new national minimum wage is determined and signed into law. The wage increase is slated to last six months. The naira is Nigeria's currency. The government also announced a commitment of $130 million for the purchase of gas-powered buses to reduce the cost of transport. In May, President Bola Tinubu discontinued fuel subsidy payments as part of bold reforms aimed at boosting Nigeria's economy. But the price of gas more than tripled afterward, affecting transport and commodity prices. Simon Lalong is Nigeria's Minister of Labor and Employment. He chaired the meeting between the government and organized labor. After much discussion, the following agreements were reached. The NLC and the TUC accept to suspend for 30 days the planned indefinite nationwide strike scheduled to begin Tuesday, the 3rd of October, 2023. A minimum wage committee shall be inaugurated within one month from the death of this agreement. Soon after ending the fuel subsidy, Tinubu floated the Naira against other global tenders to eliminate multiple exchange rates. The decision also hurt the economy and citizens, causing the Naira to fall to historic lows in recent weeks. Nigeria is one of Africa's top oil producers but relies on imports for its petroleum products, putting pressure on oil marketers to meet local demand. On Monday, Lalong said authorities were working to fix Nigeria's refineries and that the government will introduce tax incentives for private sector businesses to help them cope. He also said authorities will boost distribution of subsidized fertilizers to farmers. This week, Nigeria marked its 63rd independence anniversary and Tinubu acknowledged the plight of the citizens. But in a televised address, he urged Nigerians to be patient. At my inauguration, I said that bold reforms were necessary to place our nation on the path of prosperity and growth. I am attuned to the hardship that have come. Reform may be painful, but it is what greatness and the future require. Samuel Danjima is a civil servant. He says he expects to benefit from the weight of word, but remains skeptical. Even the 35,000 naira that the federal government approved, when you go through it, you discover that they had to take that decision when they discover that labor and TUC are were serious. Whether the, the federal government will keep to the promise or not, it is God that can see. If the economy will not be better, at that 35,000 naira that they will pay for the next six months, I want to assure you that it will still go, it will, it will go nowhere. In August, workers' unions held massive street demonstrations over the issue and in September held a two-day warning strike. For now, many will be waiting to see if the government keeps its promise to ease the suffering of many Nigerians. Timothy Obiezu, VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. You're listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I'm Douglas Simpoga in Washington. Today is Wednesday, October 4th. For more African news and features, visit our website at voafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. A top U.S. legislator has asked the South African government to demonstrate its value for Washington as it courts other foreign powers like Russia and China.
At a hearing on Capitol Hill last week, witnesses examined the current foreign policy between the two countries. VOA's Ignatius Arno has this report. South Africa's growing partnership with Russia and China, U.S. officials say, has its long-standing partner, the United States, unnerved about its future bilateral relationship. That prompted a congressional hearing at the U.S. Capitol, where witnesses gave accounts of how South Africa's foreign policy and that of the ruling party, the African National Congress, or the ANC, does not reflect the position of the South African people. John James is chair of the U.S. Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa. South Africa has a choice in what partners to prioritize, but so too does the United States. I believe it entirely appropriate to scrutinize the conduct of our important partner when the risks compromising our strong, dynamic, bilateral relationship um, are are at hand. It's my belief that South Africa is currently at at an inflection point, and I view the next several months as critical in demonstrating whether it will put our important partnership back on track. Anthony Carroll is an adjunct professor at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies in Washington. He said, despite the Southern African nation boasting of a very vibrant multi-party democracy with a robust civil society, it is becoming, quote, a failing state, end of quote. He cited its failure to deliver critical public services like electricity and deadly xenophobia as examples. But Carroll said the African Growth and Opportunity Act, known commonly as AGOA, should not be impacted. While I share the concerns of many about the direction of our relations with South Africa, I would oppose making it ineligible for AGOA. First, I do not believe that its embrace of Russia constitutes a direct threat to U.S. security. Second, goods exported to the United States provide critical jobs to South Africa and provide lower priced goods for the U.S. consumers. Third, South Africa's removal from ago would only play into the hands of anti-U.S. elements within the ANC and the radical EFF party. Reddy Klabi, a South African journalist, cited a recent survey that shows an increasing dissatisfaction of South Africans with democracy. She said, South Africa's democracy must not be left to collapse because, according to her, Russia has been successful in countries where democracy is called flimsy, end of quote. She mentioned Madagascar, Sudan, and the Central African Republic. A strong economy keeps rogue nations out. We have seen Russia's aggressive return and re-engagement with the continent, and we must use the word return and re-engagement because it suggests that there was a time when Russia left Africa, which is not a message that it preaches. Chris Marulan is International Chief Executive Officer at Good Governance Africa, a Johannesburg-based non-profit organization focused on promoting good governance in Africa. He told the committee that South Africa's neutral position in the Russia-Ukraine conflict is in sharp contrast to the country's constitutional aspirations. Many see strategic non-alignment as incongruent with our constitutional aspirations of human dignity. The achievements of equality and the advancement of human rights and freedom. The expert said the U.S. and South Africa have far more in common than with Russia, such as a free press and an independent judiciary. That, they argue, could offer a roadmap to improve relations between the two countries. Ignatius Anno, VOA News, Washington. And that's it for this Wednesday, October 4th edition of Depret Africa. We thank you for being our guests this morning. For more African news and features, visit our website at voafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are also on YouTube, where you can watch our TV shows, Africa 54, Straight Talk Africa, and Red Carpet. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa team, I'm Douglas Impoga in Washington, wishing you a very great day. When a mother dies during childbirth, the future dies with her. That's according to a recent report by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. On the next edition of Our Voices, we take a closer look at the maternal and infant mortality rate and examine some initiatives that have been put in place to ensure the survival of mother and child. Join the conversation Wednesday.